in the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter. While they were talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. And he said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a ghost does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. And while in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. And then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem." You are witnesses of these things. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. Shift work for disciples. If you or anyone you've known has ever been involved with shift work, you know how difficult it can be. They talk about the sacrifices that you have to make. People that do shift work talk about their their rhythms sort of being out of balance because of constantly shifting between times. I remember in another church that I served, I had a gentleman there who worked the coal mines, and then the shifts were 7 to 3, 3 to 11, 11 to 7. And I always knew when he was on the midnight shift, I'll say this, he was very faithful, but if he worked a midnight shift on Saturday night, He did not miss church. He just didn't go to bed, and he would come to church that morning. Now, I always knew if he'd work, because usually about halfway through the sermon, he's kind of dozing off, you know. He's kind of catching the nap there just a little bit. Well, one Sunday, I was preaching along, and sure enough, I kind of glanced over to the side, and he had checked out. He had checked out. He was leaning on the aisle. He was completely out. Well, I didn't think anything of it. As he left, I said, well, I, I see you worked a midnight shift last night. And he said, well, no, I was off this weekend. Well, either way, I guess it was difficult for him, right? The truth is, shift work for disciples is even more difficult than that. And here in Luke 24, Jesus calls his disciples to make some very important shifts. That is, to move from where they are to where they need to be so that they might be all that God wants them to be moving into the future. And notice there are five shifts. I've listed them there in the bulletin. Know that I'll be, lest you be tempted to doze off yourself, I'll be moving rapidly through these, I promise. What are the shifts that Jesus calls us to today as his disciples? Well, first of all, a shift from idle speculation to a face-to-face encounter. Remember these early disciples, they still weren't sure. They'd heard rumors, but they weren't sure what's happened. What's going to happen in the future? A lot of speculations going through their mind. But all of a sudden, something changes that. What is it? A face-to-face encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. No longer did they have to speculate about what might have happened. They witnessed it face-to-face, person-to-person. Did you catch that in the scriptures? Look at my hands. Look at my feet. It's me, Jesus said. And in that face-to-face encounter, their lives started to be transformed in a magnificent way. And friends, I want you to know today... That that same face-to-face encounter, that personal encounter with the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ is available to you, just as it was to these early disciples. Face-to-face encounter can change everything. Bill Tennant, he tells the story, he doesn't know why, but he says he, as he walked from his parking garage to his office building in the city, he always felt threatened by street people, by homeless people. He said even sometimes he would cross to the other side of the street to avoid encountering them. He says he doesn't know where it came from, but he was threatened. He always had these, he said he had these ideas. Maybe some of them were criminals. 
Maybe they're going to harm me. They're probably going to hit me up for money. So he said, I tried to avoid them. Then he said a life-changing event happened. He got involved with a men's group at his church. Turns out the men's group's monthly project was volunteering at the homeless shelter. And Bill Tennant said, finally, at the urging of a colleague, I went to the homeless shelter, volunteered for the entire Saturday. He not only helped cook and serve, but Bill Tennant sat at table with these that he called street people. He sat at table with them and had a conversation with them. Now, Tennant goes into a long explanation and and expose on it, but I'll boil it down to the bottom. When it came to the bottom line, he simply said, it's amazing when someone quits being an issue and they become a person. No longer do you speculate about them, but you get to know them. Face-to-face encounters can change everything. And friends, on a much larger and grander scale than that, a face-to-face encounter with Jesus Christ can change everything. And he can show us. He can show us how to not talk about issues and instead to talk about people. That's the encounter, the personal encounter that Jesus had with the disciples. Now, that's a hard shift to make because we live in a time when everybody has speculations about everything, right? Opinion about everything. Jesus is not interested in your opinion. He's interested in your life to walk alongside you as he did on the Emmaus Road. And it's a tough shift to make. But know this, you do not make this shift by yourself. Jesus lives today and he'll walk alongside us and move us from where we are to where we need to be. Secondly, to shift from chaotic confusion to enlightened understanding. No doubt they were very much confused and baffled by everything that had transpired up to this point. But then Jesus makes an appearance, and did you hear it in the scriptures? He opened their minds to understand the scripture. You see, their particular understanding of scripture had been disappointed. They thought the Messiah was going to be an earthly ruler. They had a certain interpretation of the scripture. But all of a sudden, Jesus gave them new light and new understanding. And that helped to lead them forward. God today, regardless of the confusion in your own life, whatever confusing events or confusing thoughts may come your way, and it is a chaotic and confusing time. Sometimes we want to wall ourselves off in our own little modules of confusion. But what the resurrected Lord Jesus Christ does is he comes and he puts windows in those walls and he allows light to shine in And the more we allow that light to shine into our lives, the more we become who he needs for us to be. I had a good friend in seminary. You remember the the comic strips all the time. They would, if somebody had an idea or or a new understanding, how the light bulb would be sort of painted over their head. Well, he had this habit of if he he caught something, if he got something out of one of the lectures, for example, he would go click, and that was him turning the light switch on. Click. I can even remember worshiping with him in Cannon Chapel there on the campus of Emory University. And somebody would be preaching a sermon. And if something really hit him, he'd lean over to me and go, click. And I knew that the light was coming on for him. I remember we were in the society, personality, and ethics class, probably the most difficult class in our seminary program. And they had a guest lecturer. He lectured for over two hours. We endured the lecture. And we came out of that lecture. And my friend turned to me and he said, click. I said, you got to be kidding me. No way. He said, actually, that's the light switch going off. I have no idea what the guy was talking about. No idea. Sometimes the light switch goes on. Sometimes it goes off. But let me tell you something, friends. Jesus Christ, the one who lives today, the light of the world, he wants to open our minds, open our hearts, and shine his light in there into those spaces, even the darkest corners, so that we can move from confusion to enlightened understanding. It's not an easy shift to make. I know that. But know that you do not make that shift alone. Jesus lives today, and he will journey with us and move us from where we are to where we need to be. Third, Shifting from terrifying fear to magnifying faith. Notice in the scriptures, and that, by the way, in the original language, it's a very strong word in verse 37. They were startled and terrified. That's a perfect translation. They were terrified. 
So they had this terrifying fear. Even with Jesus coming, they're like, "My, can you imagine? Of course they would be afraid. But just one word, one word from Jesus, and he prepares them to be people who would magnify his fate from then on throughout history. We know the book of Acts, right, that continued to spread the word. One word, and it's simply this, it's me. I'm alive. Jesus says, it's me, see? I'm alive. And all of a sudden, their fear begins to dissipate and their faith begins to grow. And friends, that's what the resurrected Jesus Christ wants to do in our lives as well. They turned from being huddled together in fear to being amazing, amazing disciples. One event, one event, one word can turn it around. Avon Best tells the story. He grew up outside of Boston. He said there was a kid on his basketball team by the name of Jamie. He said Jamie was a mediocre player at best, and he played what we call, and we called when I played as well, he played scared. When he got in the game, he was just frightened. He was just scared, nervous, couldn't perform. He said that one summer, a local college held a big basketball camp for all of the teams in the area, and the person that came to give the shooting instruction demonstration was none other than Larry Bird. He said there we were, hundreds of us, the, our idol giving us shooting instruction. And he said after Larry Bird had finished, he looked and he's gazing through this hundreds of young people and he points to a kid and he says, now you come up and shoot a foul shot. It was Jamie. Avon Best said we all looked at each other. He said Jamie walked up, he handed Jamie the ball and he said, now shoot a free throw, son. He said you could see Jamie's hands shaking. But he shot it. Swish. He said, Larry Bird looked at him and he said, great form, great shot. That's all he said. Avon Best says, I have an idea what happened, but it was still amazing because from that day forward, Jamie was a different player. Somehow confidence had interrupted him and intervened. Just one word. Friends, one word One word can take care of our fears, regardless of the source of those fears. Now, they may not dissipate immediately, but the more that we expose ourselves to the living faith of Jesus Christ, the more he will help to address those fears in our lives. One word from Jesus Christ can change everything still today. And whether you're here or listening, I want you to know that one word from Jesus Christ is, I'm alive. I'm here. It's me. I'm for you, not against you. And friends, that can set you free to be the person that God has intended for you to be. It's not an easy shift to make. But friends, we don't have to make it alone. Because Jesus lives. He walks alongside of us. He'll move us from where we are to where we need to be. Fourth, he invites them to shift from Friday sorrow to Sunday's joy. Now, friends, I'll be the first to admit this is a very, very difficult shift to make. We all know, either firsthand or through someone else, how the trauma of yesterday can rob people of the joy of today. Imagine these disciples. They watched their Savior die. They saw him suffer. They saw the pain, the punishment, and the grief. Friday was a dark, dark day. And again, I say we know how the trauma of yesterday can rob us of the joy of today. But friends, Jesus lives. And when Je- because Jesus lives, this is still Easter Sunday. And regardless of the depth of your sorrow or hurt or brokenness, because Jesus lives, there is always Sunday and there is always the third day. Always the third day. He will help us all to look beyond our sorrows ultimately, no matter how many or manifold they may be. And ultimately, Sunday's joy, Sunday's joy will swallow up Friday's sorrow. 
I know that's a hard shift to make. But we don't make it alone. Jesus lives. He's beside us and moves us from where we are to where we need to be. Finally, he calls them to shift what I say from park to drive. You say, Ken, how do you get that? Well, look at the last verse of that scripture. He tells them all of this. He reveals himself to them, shows himself to them, tells them all of this good news. And then finally he says in verse 48, you are witnesses of these things. In other words, I'm not telling you this great good news and I haven't made my appearance to you just so you can receive it and sit idly in park. I've shared it with you so that you can share it with the world. And that's exactly what the disciples did in many, many different regions of the world. They went forth and shared the good news of the resurrected Jesus. And friends, he still calls us toward that today. That's your call as a follower of Jesus Christ. To shift from park and put it into drive. By giving and living and witnessing and testifying. In your words, your attitudes, your actions. This is who we are. Some of you have heard me tell it, and it's one of my favorite stories from old, but the days of the stagecoach, remember that? There were three classes of passengers, first class, second class, and third class. You say, how could that be possible? It's all in the same little coach. Well, first class passengers paid for a ticket so that when the road, as often happened in a rainstorm, became mucky and muddy and boggy, if the stagecoach got stuck and you bought a first class ticket, you remained in the coach. If you bought a second class ticket, you had to get out and walk until the stagecoach was free. If you bought a third class ticket, you had to get out and push and help extract the stagecoach from the bulk. Now I know today, even when it comes to faith, we would love to just be first class passengers. Just park ourselves, be catered to. Friends, I have to say, when it comes to following this Jesus... There's no first class, no second class, only third class. We're all called to sacrifice ourselves on behalf of others, to be participants engaged in serving, living, giving, witnessing, test, all of that. That's why we say we're a Matthew 25 church. Because when things get difficult and things get mired and mucky, as they have certainly this past year, we get out and push. And we help, and we connect, and we keep moving forward. Friends, these are not easy shifts to make. But know today you do not try to make them alone. Jesus lives, and because he lives, he walks alongside of us and will help us move from where we are to where we need to be so that we can be the people of the living Jesus every single day. This is our call. Will you hear it? Will you receive it? Let us pray. Lord God, in bringing forth Jesus from the tomb, you brought forth life and joy and hope, showing for all people that indeed light is on the horizon and in our very midst. Help us today, O Lord, to trust you, to recommit ourselves to the living Lord, that he might continue to work his transforming work in our lives, shifting us from where we are to where he would have us be. In his holy name we pray. Amen.